By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we're playing a game of old school magic Highlander. And that means that there can be only one of each card in the deck except for the basic lands. And uh, these Highlander decks are always built around a, um, a legendary creature. And I'm playing Andy, by the way, and Andy challenged me for this Highlander duel, so thank you for doing that. I always love to play Highlander. And he's coming with a blue and white deck, and his legendary captain is Hunding Gjornersson. And it's a, it's a pretty cool card. I think it's not reprinted. It's beautiful art by Richard Thomas, and yeah, it has Rampage 1. Maybe you don't know what that means. But Rampage basically means for each creature that blocks this creature, apart from the first one, it gets plus one, plus one, because this has Rampage one. If it would have had Rampage two, it would have gotten plus two, plus two, etc., etc. Now I'm playing uh, pretty much the same colors, actually. We didn't know from each other, of course, what kind of decks we were going to play. I'm playing with Rubinia Soul Singer, blue, white, and green, and Rubinia Soul Singer is a 2-3 summon legend, of course, as well, and I can tap it to gain control of target creature, and Rubinia does not untap or untap uh, this creature. If Rubinia becomes untapped, you lose control of this creature. You may choose not to untap Rubinia as normal during your untap phase, and you also lose control of target creature if either Rubinia leaves play or you lose control of Rubinia, right? So Rubinia is kind of a way to steal stuff, so it's, it's quite interesting because we're both playing with blue and white and I'm playing with a little bit of green in there. Now, before we go to the deck tags, um, I would just like to point out that you can find a lot of information in the description below, including the rule set. So usually I get some questions like, what rules are you following? Which I completely understand because in old school, there are so many different rule sets. So if you're curious about that, check the description below. There I have links and information about what Highlander rule set we're using for this game. Okay, so if you're into that, check the description below. Another thing you can do is you can check the timestamps in the description below, and that can take you straight to a deck tech section. You know, if you want to see the deck of my opponent, Andy, if you want to see my deck, if you want to go straight to the deck tech, you can click there on the timestamps. And you can also click on a timestamp called MTG Games, and that will take you straight to the action. So you can just skip all this introduction nonsense, click on MTG Games, and just go straight to the action. Um, so those are kind of the options. And here we are going to continue with the deck tech. I'm actually going to start with the deck of Andy. Let's take a look at his Hunding, Hunding Gjernersson deck. Sorry for my pronunciation, by the way. Let's go. And here we see the deck of Andy hunting with Hunding. And uh, when we look at this deck, he really wants to hunt. I think it's, it's quite an aggressive deck. So we're seeing those creatures uh, there at the left top, right? And then kind of going through to the middle. So we're seeing quite a lot of one drops with the Savannah lines, the Acacian Javelin near Tundra Wolves and those cards. Then we see some two drops going flowing into some three drops. And after that, it kind of becomes more scarce. There are a couple of four and five drops, but not that many. So I think what he wants to do is really kind of get his army out quick, probably use cards like Crusade and Morale and Power Stone to give his creatures an extra boost and, you know, deal even more damage. And then, of course, he's got some con control. Uh, he's got a control magic. He's got a counter spell to kind of try to control the board a little bit. Um, he's also playing with an enchantment alteration. That's kind of funny. That's nice to see. And um, we also see one green card in here, by the way, the Sylvan Library. So that's quite interesting. And he can actually make uh, some other colored mana if he wants to. He's got, of course, their City of Brass. He's got the um, the Veil there, the card from um, uh, from Fallen Empires that you can tap to make any color mana. He's got a Felwer Stone, so maybe if he's lucky, I'm going to have uh, a green source. And I am playing with green, so that's pretty that's pretty smart. And he's also got the implements of implements of sacrifice, also kind of called the small uh, uh, the small black lotus, which is kind of funny, right? Because it's just a cheap card from uh, Fallen Empire. I actually personally think. It's a useful card. You don't see it often. I think this actually could be played today in modern EDH, but you never see it. I, I think it could work. It's two to cast. Um, you can pay one and tap it, and you can sacrifice the implement. And then you add two mana of any one color to your mana pool. I think this card would have been even cooler if it would give you two mana 
of a color combination of your choice. So if you could say, I want one blue and one green, for example, I mean, then this card would be even more interesting. But the fact is with an Implements of Sacrifice on the board, you can pay one in second and you can just get two blue and then, hey, you can counter, right? And especially in Highlander, I find I find is a very useful card when you play multiple colors because it's, it's color fixing. It's colorless color fixing. How relaxed is that? Um, now, when we're looking at the rest of the deck, I think... The strategy here is a little bit, like I said, trying to put out small creatures quickly, put pressure on the board. And then, of course, uh, your danger when you have a strategy like that is that you're running out of cards at a certain point because maybe you have a lot of cheaper creatures and you're running out of cards. So it's, it's obvious that Andy thought about this because he's playing with a lot of books and he's also playing with Ring of Renewal. Ring of Renewal, not a really cool card. Five to cast and then five and tap. And then you get to draw, uh, you get you have to discard a card, and then you can draw two cards. Now, that may not sound very good, like you're probably thinking, ah, whatever, but listen up. If you have no cards in hand and you activate Ring of Renewal, there's nothing that you can discard, and you can just draw two new cards. Besides that, another advantage is maybe, you know, you're later in the game and you've got one of those smaller creatures like Savannah Lines, which is not very useful late game. You can just discard it and get two new cards, um, replace it with two new cards with Ring of Renewal. There is a little if or a little but or whatever. Um, Ring of Renewal, that discard clause of Ring of Renewal is random. So it's not like you can choose, unfortunately. But I think Ring of Renewal, he's probably going to use it when he has no cards in hand or when the cards that he has in hand are just no good, right? So he, he doesn't really mind discarding a card and getting two back in place. Um, so we see Book of Rest, we see Jam Day Tome, we see Jalem Tome, so a lot of ways to draw cards. Another card that I find interesting here, there are actually quite a lot of fun and exciting cards in your deck, uh, Andy, but one of the other cards I find interesting here is Enchantment Alteration. Uh, it's one blue, it's an instant from Legends, and uh, you can just replace target enchant creature, so you can move target enchant creature to another creature of your choice. So that could be quite goofy, because he can use that, of course, on his control magic. Let's say he controls a creature on my side and I play out a better creature, then he can just use enchantment alteration and move his control magic to the creature that he wants to control now, which is actually pretty cool. Um, another thing that he can do, he can also take over my enchant creatures and he can say, you know what? Uh, you're trying to pump your creature with, I don't know, a holy strength. I'm gonna use my enchantment alteration and put it on one of my creatures instead. So I really like that card because it's versatile, I think. Enchantment Alteration is even more fun when you play a format like this in multiplayer. So this is a one-on-one, -on -one, but obviously a Highlander 100, 100 card format is really ideal for multiplayer as well. And certain cards like Enchantment Alteration become much better in a multiplayer setting. Another card I would like to point out is actually a card that's right under the Timmy Talks pin, and that is Witch Hunter. Witch Hunter is just one of my favorite cards from the dark. It, it's it's a white card with blue ability, right? Which is really funny. And it's a rare card as well in the dark. It's two white and two to cast for a 1-1. One, one. So that doesn't sound very good, does it? But it does two really unique things, especially when you consider it's a white card. You can tap it and can do one damage to the opponent. Only to an opponent, not to a creature, right? So it's not like a Timmy, but it gets pretty close. And then it has this cool... Uh, a time elemental ability, which is really unique for white. You can pay two white and, and one, you can tap it, and then you can bounce target creature of the opponent. Now, again, unfortunately, only of the opponent and not of yourself. So it's not very versatile, but still, this Witch Hunter could be incredibly annoying. You know, I can think of a lot of creatures in my deck that won't be very happy to see that Witch Hunter. So that's really kind of a threat. Now, I could go on about this deck for a for a while, a long while longer, because there are a lot more interesting cards in this deck. Uh, but I think we kind of get the gist of what Andy wants to do with this deck. So like I said, he probably wants to put on early pressure and then kind of control the game from there. That's what I think Andy is aiming for. So this is his deck. And now let's take a look at my deck, Rubinha's Plants. So here we see my deck, Rubinha's Plants. And what I basically wanted to do is I wanted to make a deck in the spirit of Rubinia Soul Singer. So I thought, okay, what if Rubinia Soul Singer would make her own deck? What kind of cards would you put in there? And Rubinia Soul Singer, in my opinion, is all about control, right? It's a control card. So I was like, okay, I need a lot of blue and I need a lot of control cards. I want to steal stuff. I want to copy stuff. And I just want to own the board, basically. So what I decided to do where my opponent Andy is going more on you know, the aggro style and the tempo play. 
I'm going way more on the long-term control play. So I'm playing with, you know, Control Magic, Steel Artifact, Preacher, um, Old Man of the Sea. I'm playing with, you know, Clone, Vesuvian Double Ganger, Dance of Many. You know, I just want to control the board. I'm also playing with the combination of Simbat and Field of Dreams. I'm playing with a lot of annoying counter spells. Um, so I just want to kind of stretch the game. And, um, you, you know, my trick, for example, I'm playing Giant Tortoise, right? It's it's one blue and one. It's a one one, but when it's untapped, it's a one four. So that really kind of shows what I want to do with this deck. I just want to, you know, close the door early with the Giant Tortoise and maybe a Wall of Air and then slowly take over control of the game. You know, I'm playing an Argivian Archaeologist. You're not playing an Argivian Archaeologist to finish a game quickly. That's all, you know, long-term plans. So when you're playing more long-term, you're also going to add, you know, bigger, beefier creatures that you're probably going to play out because the game is probably going to take longer. Plus, when you have a nice, beefy creature, you can also play a clone over that creature. So I'm playing with, you know, Mahamoti Jin. I'm playing with Sarah Angel. So I'm playing with some of the, the bigger creatures uh, in the meta. Now, uh, there's one creature I'd like to point out because, again, fun, funny enough, uh, both Annie and myself are playing with this creature and a creature that I usually never see. That's a Fodalian Mage. One blue and two to cast. Uh, we've both chosen, I think, for the Mark Pool art, which is my favorite, my personally, my, my favorite piece of art of the Fodalian Mages. And it's a Summon Merfolk, a 1-1, and you can pay one blue and tap it, and then it counters target spell if caster of target spell does not pay an additional one. Now, I think one of the problems that I have with this card, one of the, because I have multiple, but one of the main problems that I have with this card is I've got to pay one blue and tap it instead of just tapping it for the effect. So I got to play one blue and tap it, and then my opponent can just pay any color mana to cancel the whole effect out. So basically I'm paying one blue to force my opponent to pay one colorless. And that just doesn't sound very good to me. But... I do like the card. I like the idea that if my opponent doesn't have mana open, I can counter everything. And I like the idea of combining this card with a power sink, with a force spike, and just to be this annoying thing that my opponent has to think about. Every time he has to think, oh yeah, he's got the Vodalian Mage. I got to keep one mana open. And I don't expect him to waste any removal on a card like this. You just don't want to do that. It, it kind of feels bad to waste removal to a 1-1 one, one for 3 that has an ability that's mwah, you know what I mean? So I'm really looking forward to kind of see, okay, is Fodalian Mage really bad? Or is it maybe secretly a better card than you might think it is? I still think it's really bad, but I've put it in the deck and I'm, I'm putting it to the test in this batch. If I draw it, I'm going to put it out there. I want to see how it works. Um, there are a few shout outs that I want to give um, to some of the people that have altered some of the cards in this deck. Now, first off goes to the Protocol Sorcerer. So you probably see it's a Stormtrooper. There's an altar made by Nick View. Nick, thank you, man. Um, I'm putting his Instagram link here um, in the video. So check him out on, on Insta. He's got some really cool altars. He sent this altar to me. I really appreciate it. And I also got some altars sent by Librarian of Lang. I mean, that is that is one cool dude. He makes awesome altars. I think uh, a lot of you are familiar with his work if you're watching this channel as well. So you can see the Tolaria is done by uh, Librarian of Lang and also the Disenchant is done by the Librarian of Lang. So really nice altars. And also I've got an altar of Ghost Ship here made by Lady Death Touch. It's a pretty cool um, secret treasure map ghost ship altar. So um, that's kind of nice. And they're also, not that I'm mentioning it anyway, there are also a few artist proofs in this deck. Two artist proofs made by Pete Venters. So um, we see the rocket launcher there. So as you can see, there's a little goblin drawn on it. So that's by uh, by Pete Venters. And we also see a Sage of Latinam altar, or art artist proof, I should say, with on the back, he drew the Sage of Latinam. So you can kind of see the the back of those artist proofs. So on the other side of the artist proof, you can see the original card, which is also signed by Pete Vanders. So Pete Vanders, by the way, uh, a great guy, and he makes beautiful altars. And then we also see the Argivian Archaeologist. That's also an artist proof uh, with the Argivian Archaeologist there drawn on the back also by the original artist. So I just wanted to point it out because that is, uh, this is pretty cool. So maybe you're looking at it thinking, what are those cards all about? Well, they are artist proofs and the other ones are altars. So now you know. Um, did I mention, by the way, when we're talking about control, I'm also playing Field of Dreams, Millstone, and Simbat in this deck. So that can really be nasty if I manage to assemble it. Chances of that happening, 
really, really slim. But if it happens, I'm going to be happy. Oh, um, one more thing. There just sorry, sorry, but it just keep things keep popping up in my mind. Um, there is one change when you look at this deck photo. There are actually two things that are not correct. In the uh, deck that I ended up playing, I've changed two planes for two basic forests. And I've done that because of the land tax in deck. Because land tax, you know, will allow me to look up for basic land. So I thought, oh, wait a minute. I do need basic forests in my deck to look up if I needed to cast my Rubinia Soul Singer. So that is, those are the only two changes. So I've taken two planes out and I've added... Um, to more forests. And I know that some of you maybe are wondering, okay, how many um, lands is he actually playing in this deck? And I can I can look it up for you because I wrote it down. Let's have a look because I'm getting these, these questions all the time. And I'm actually playing with 39 lands. So I'm playing with a lot of lands, but I think it's important when you're um, playing a Highlander deck like this, especially when you're playing two colors, possibly even three colors, because maybe I want to cast a Rubinia. Okay, so this is my deck. We looked at the deck of Andy, and now let's go to the games. Game number one, and we're about to start here. I'm sitting on the left with the Timmy Playmat, and my opponent Andy, aka Steam Floggery, is sitting on the right, starting with the Runes of Troikar, the sack land from Arabia, uh, sorry, from Fallen Empires, not Arabian Nights. Uh, you can tap it for one white, what Andy's doing right now, but you can also tap and sack it for two white. So it can be quite handy. I do like using the Runes of Troy Care in combination with, for example, Armageddon. And here we see an Aeopile by Andy as well. I'm playing a Desert and then I'm playing my first creature, the Giant Tortoise. So Giant Tortoise is a 1-1, one, one, but as long as it's untapped, it is actually a 1-4. It gets plus 0, plus 3. So that means that Andy cannot destroy it with the Aeopile and playing an island, tapping all three of his mana, and ooh, there's a Feral's Zealot, more cards from Fallen Empires, it's a 2-2, and when it attacks and is not blocked, uh, the controller, so Andy can choose for it not to deal any damage, and instead it can deal three damage to any creature. So that's an extra option with the Zealot. Now, right now it's not too dangerous because I can just block it on the Tortoise. So, uh, but maybe Andy wants to attack with it and use the AO Pile. Probably not, but maybe. Because we do know that Andy has a lot of smaller creatures, so I'm kind of expecting him from now on to just play a creature every turn. Tapping three, and what creature are we going to see here from his deck? Kind of uh, doubting what to play. There it is, there's the Onulet. So that's a 2-2 creature originally from the Antiquities expansion, and when it dies, you gain life. I believe you gain two life. Maybe more. I haven't played with it in a while. So uh, I'm playing a basic four, tapping all four here, casting a clay statue, three one from antiquities and two to regenerate. There we see Andy untapping his lands. Andy missed a land drop, by the way. That is bad news. Let's hope for him that he can find lands because the game is just far more interesting if we can all just draw our lands. Second, the ruins of Troikar and playing out a witch hunter. That's not great. And it also shows maybe how desperate Andy is here already, not finding the lands he needs. The thing is, Witch Hunter is a great card for Andy, but he needs an extra white, and he just sacked his white source to cast a Witch Hunter. So it's kind of an unfortunate uh, scenario here for Andy. I'm playing my uh, Tropical Island, by the way, my blue and green dual land, and attacking with the statue here, dealing three damage to Andy, who's not blocking, so he's going to go to 27. We both decided to start on 30 life. I think if we would play multiplayer here, we would probably start on 40 life. And attacking here with both creatures. Now what I can do now is block the, probably the Zealot on the Giant Tortoise and use my Desert. Yeah, using my Desert to deal that extra point of damage to the Feral Zealot being a 2-2. So the, the Feral Zealot's going to die. I wonder if Andy saw that when he decided to attack. Is he going to, yeah, he's going to use the AO pile to destroy my giant tortoise. I think that's a good decision. And of course, the problem for Andy here is that he's not drawing into any lands. He needs lands. If he can just get his second white, because the witch hunter could be super annoying for me. You know, he can start bouncing my creatures, but he needs two white and one to do that. Attacking with the statue, going to go to 24, and then I'm going to tap 6. So we're going to see, oh, I wanted to say we're going to see a big creature, but we're seeing a brain geyser instead. Probably even better than a big creature. Drawing 4 cards, so I've got 8 cards in hand now. Wow, I got a discard, and it's looking very bad for Andy. You, he really needs his land, so he's going to deal 1 damage, of course, at the end of my turn with the Witch Hunter. 
but he really needs to start drawing into lands now. And he also hope he does just for the game. It's 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 more of an interesting game if he can find some lands. Pointing out to his witch hunter, by the way. And it looks like he's going to play something. Okay, Implements of Sacrifice. At least that's something he can sack it to get two mana next turn. Also attack for two. So I'm slowly going down in life. I'm on 25 right now, so things are not too bad. Okay, there we see a Fountain of Youth from the Dark. Zero to cast and two and tap and you gain a life. And that card, I can tell you, is actually better than you think it is. It's pretty good and... Um, in multiplayer and also just pretty useful in slower games like this and i'm playing my pirate ship here oh that's a problem for andy with the pirate ship i can kill his witch hunter he needs he really needs a second white or is he gonna sacrifice his implement of sacrifice to bounce it that doesn't sound like a good deal he needs to deal with the pirate ship right now that is important, or else he's going to lose his Witch Hunter, get even further behind. He doesn't have a land, it seems, or else he would have played it out already. Uh, man, Andy, this is not your game. The good news is, after this, we played another game, by the way, because this seems to be quite one-sided so far for the simple reason that Andy is not finding any of his land. Sacrificing the Implements of Sacrifice, tapping a blue. Oh, playing a Timmy. Oh, <laughs> And that's the Alter Timmy that uh, I gave Andy when he joined my uh, my Patreon program. If you join uh, Timmy Talks on Patreon, I, uh, I sent you a signed Timmy. And this is one of those, uh, those Timmies. I also sent you a nice Timmy pin, by the way. So if you're interested in joining, uh, check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And, uh, and have a look. Maybe it's something for you. Now let's get back to the game. Of course, I have Pirate Ship. I can now kill Timmy, which feels really bad, but I probably have to do it for the simple reason that it could get annoying with him trying to kill my statue. Okay, deciding to kill his Witch Hunter first, probably finding that more annoying. And I don't want to take the risk that he's going to draw into a white mana. On the other hand, if he does draw into a white mana, in response, I can always use... The pirate ship, so maybe this is not the best play. Oh, and there we see Rubinia Soul Singer. Wow, so I happen to uh, find it and I have a forest. So it's really the opposite scenarios here. I'm drawing exactly what I need, including the lands, including the brain geyser to draw even more cards. And my opponent, Andy, he's just very unfortunate. He's stuck on land. You know, he sacked his land, probably thinking he would draw into more land. He's just not finding it right now. So let's see. Let's 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 hope that you know maybe he can he can find a balance. For example, you know um, the the cool thing about uh, Protocol Sorcerer, by the way, is it can actually kill itself, which is which is pretty interesting. So now he's going to use his Protocol Sorcerer to ping probably my clay statue or to ping me because of course I can regenerate the clay statue. He's actually killing the clay statue, and I'm letting it die probably because I've got double blue open. For a counter spell, possibly. And he's also playing a Fountain of Youth here. What else can Andy do, really? He's really stuck in the tank. He's trying to find a way out. He probably can. Next turn, I can actually use my Rubinia Soul Singer to steal the Timmy. I wonder if I'm going to do that. And it looks like we're kind of discussing all the options. So I'm attacking. I'm blocking with the Soul Singer, which is a 2-3. That means some life here for Andy. Who probably doesn't want me to steal it. But he's it's, it's pretty clear he's in, uh, in desperation mode, you know. He's like, at least I'm going to get some life. Maybe I can prolong things a little bit. So uh, I'm stealing the Tim with the Rubinia Soul Singer. Attacking him for four, which I can because Andy has an island to make matters even worse. Playing a phantom monster. So a 3-3 three, three flyer. End of turn. Andy's going to make a life. Going to go back up to 20. And, uh, oh man, he's just trying to find lands. He must be so desperate right now. He must be so desperate. And I'm also making a life with my Fountain of Youth. And uh, attacking now for seven. 
So he's going to drop to 13, probably going to make a life and then go up to 14, playing my Argivian Archaeologist. And that means I can actually get back my clay statue. Perhaps I had the Argivian Archaeologist already in hand when I allowed him to kill my clay statue. That's probably the case. And uh, he's going up to 14, but he's so far behind right now. He really needs a balance. Balance can get him back. Pinging him for one, putting him on 13, and also making a life with my Fountain of Youth. Going to attack him again for seven. Going to go to six. And Air Elemental. Oh, man. This is just brutal. He's going to make a life. Going to go to seven. At least Andy is trying to prolong the game for as long as it needs, as he needs, as he can, I should say. And there is the Knights that he's losing. Pinging him, going to six. And that's it. That is game one. Well, I think, Andy, this wasn't really much of a game. And the good news is for you, we played another game. Because, of course, you're not going to say after this game, okay, this was it, bye-bye. No. We decided to play another one. And hopefully in that game, Andy, you will find some land. So let's go to game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So I'm one up. Andy on the play. And, Andy, I hope that you can find your lands, man. Because we don't want to have another game one. It's really fun to play these Highlander games, but Magic, you know, when one of one of you, one of the players, I should say, is not drawing lands, it's just no fun. So at least it looks like Andy's off to a good start mana-wise. Okay, that's great. Felwer Stone ramping up the place. That's pretty good. And uh, let's hope, Andy, that uh, you can keep this up. You can get those lands and you can just play your game. And I'm finding a forest again. That is, uh, yeah, what are the odds, right? I'm really only playing with two basic forests in my entire 100 card deck. So that is kind of funny. Uh, tapping four here and casting a book, a jam day tome. Oh, four spike. That is pretty painful for Annie, but it feels really good for me. Four spike, one of those cards and he, that can be so useful at the start of the game, but so bad later in the game. And now you could really see its value. And look at that, pay, playing a Prodigal Sorcerer, a Tim that's been altered by Nick View. And it's a Stormtrooper, as you can see. So it's a pretty cool altar. And uh, I can start pinging now. So I'm feeling pretty good, actually. Let's see what Andy is going to do here. Okay, playing a Basil Monolith. So he's got quite a lot of mana, but he's not doing anything else yet. And I'm finding another island. Not finding any white sources, by the way. So that could be quite annoying. Tapping four here. Okay, finding a clay statue. That's pretty good. That's three power on the board with regeneration. Yeah, I understand the counter spell here from Andy. That regeneration is very annoying. And uh, I mean, three damage a turn that can start ticking up. So I think that's a wise decision. But what we, what, what we still don't see on the side of Andy and what I actually expected looking at his deck, I really thought that he would come out of the gate swinging because he's got quite a lot of cheaper creatures, but that's not really happening for Andy here. Ring of Renewal, this is an interesting card. Five to cast, five and tap, discard a card at random, and then he can draw two new cards. So Ring of Renewal can really give him card advantage on the long run. So that could be, uh, that could be a pretty big deal. Looks like he's a little bit... In the tank, you're thinking what to do with the other two cards in hand. Playing out a land for turn. Okay, that's a good decision. I think maybe that last card in there could be a 1-1 one, one creature. And he doesn't want to play a 1-1, one, one, of course, because I have that Tim on the board. So that Tim could be really annoying when you have a lot of 1-1s one, in your deck. Okay, there we see a Jade statue. So this is quite an interesting creature. It's an artifact. And during my combat, I can pay 2 to activate it. And it becomes a 3-6 Golem creature. And at the end of combat, it turns back into an artifact again. So it's really cool. It's, it's really like a living statue, right? It's a statue, and then during combat, it can turn into a warrior. Very cool art as well, by the way. And let's see what Andy is going to do. Looking at the board. I really wonder what he has in hand. I'm th maybe just two 1-1s. One that could be the case. I mean, you don't want to play out the 1-1s. One and then he might as well use the Ring of Renewal... Of course, you don't want to discard a card at random, but if both of the cards are 1-1s one -ones with the Timmy there, you might as well just do it. Let's see what he's going to do. Weighing out his options. What can he do here? He 
He seems to be really in the tank. I mean, he's got a ton of mana. He must be able to play out both of the cards. Maybe one of the cards is a counterspell. I mean, who knows? Although I think he would have countered the Jade Statue. Let's see. Tapping three. Two white and a blue. Casting Fuldalian Mage. Oh, that's pretty cool. So I talked about this in the deck deck because we're both playing with Fuldalian Mage. It's a Merfolk, 1-1 one, one Merfolk from Fallen Empires. You can pay one blue and tap it to counter target spell. And then the opponent can pay one mana to prevent that effect from happening. So to kind of counter the counter spell. Look at that. He's going to sack his Runes of Troikar, it seems. Cannot use the Felwer Stone for white mana because they don't have white mana. It looks like he wants to have three white. That's interesting. What can he play for three white? I have no idea. He is going to sack it. What is he going to play? Oh, interesting. That is cool. So uh, it's three white. card from the Dark the Sorcery. And it reads, um, destroy all the lands. But you can pay one life to keep your lands... Um, to prevent your lands from being destroyed, I should say. So I can just, I'm now paying four life because I don't want my lands to be destroyed. And it looks like Annie's going to take away one land. So he's going to pay three life. And also I pinked the uh, Voldalian Mage, by the way. So that's now gone. But next turn, Andy can start using his Ring of Renewal and hopefully he can draw into something useful. Because the Ring of Renewal, I mean, it's going to give him card advantage and that can eventually give him the game. I mean, he's still on 26 and I'm a little bit stuck on land. If you look at me, I'm, I'm not finding a white source. I'm now tapping to a green and a blue, it seems. What am I going to do with that? Maybe, yeah, I'm going to activate my Jade Statue, swinging in for three. Andy going to drop to 23. And that's it. That's all I'm doing. So I'm kind of giving Andy an opening here to use his ring and hopefully find something useful. Tapping, going to draw two cards. I wonder what he's going to find. And this is the nice thing of the Ring of Renewal. If your hand's empty, you don't have to discard because you discard before you draw. It's not like a Jaloom Tome where you draw and then you immediately discard. No, it's discard before you draw. And if you don't have any cards, you just draw two. And drawing two cards for five mana, that is actually pretty solid in old school. Looks like we're kind of discussing the scenarios here. And I see a gaseous form, I think, in his hand. He kind of flipped his hand there. We're just playing kitchen table, of course, so uh, it's not like we're having high stakes, so we're probably just talking about his options. He he could play the gaseous form on the Protocol Sorcerer. Looks like he's looking something up. Maybe that is what he's doing. Or maybe he's trying to look up if he can play the gaseous form on the Jade Statue. Now, he cannot do that, unfortunately, because Jade Statue is not a creature. It's only a creature during the combat phase. So I'm pinging him now for one. And passing turn here. So I guess the good news for Andy at least is he's still on 19 now. And I mean, he can keep using the Ring of Renewal. But now he'll have to discard one of his cards or not. Okay, on my end step, he's untapping the Bezel Monolith. That, that makes sense. Drawing for turn. So he's got three cards in hand. Let's hope for Andy that there's something useful. Tapping one blue. Tapping a white. Mm, tapping another blue. Okay, okay, he's playing a recall. So he's going to get one card back, I guess. So he's going to discard the clergy. What is he going to get back? He's going to get back the tomb. Okay, that makes sense. Although he already has the ring. Playing the book now, so the GM de Tome. Pinging him for one, he's on 18. I mean, the problems are still on the board, though. And, uh, you know, luckily for Andy, I, I seem to be stuck on land, so I can't really do anything else. The problem, of course, is that Andy cannot find anything to stop my Jade Statue or my Protocol Sorcerer. So he's going to untap, take turn, Bezel Monolith remains tapped. 
The nice thing about the monolith is you can untap it anytime for three mana, whenever you want, and you don't take damage, you know, for example, like a mana vault. Tapping on a draw card with the tome. And gonna take another damage, gonna go down to 14. And swinging in for three, gonna go to 11. And discarding a death ward, unfortunately. Cannot find any lands. And I'm playing with quite a lot of like higher casting cost spells. So I really need or a white source or at least like five or six mana to start playing out some of my my bigger creatures. And he's tapping two white, a blue, and then using the flower stone. Yeah, probably gonna get another card with the jam day tome. So you see Annie now is getting ahead in cards, but the problem is. He just cannot find a solution. He cannot find anything against these creatures. Maybe, I want to say, maybe this is a disenchant, but it's Taunus' weaponry. That's not really going to help Andy here. He he just, he needs at least like a disenchant or a divine offering, like something to get rid of the Jade statue. Because that thing is hitting him for three damage a turn. It's been doing that for quite a while now. Let's see what I can do here. Discarding. Oh, no, I'm not. I, I thought I was discarding the Sarah Angel, but yeah, I'm discarding Sarah Angel. First attacking, discarding Sarah Angel. That feels kind of bad. I just, I, I can't find any lands in this turn. I'm kind of having, or in this game, I'm kind of having what Andy had in game number one. And he's going to draw another card. He has to be able to find something, right? I mean... Playing a land, Urts is mine, and he's going to tap four. Okay, what are we going to do? Play an Azur Drake. Finally, Andy, you've got something of a blocker. Oh, power sink. That is really brutal. Power sinking at the right time, and I had two blue open as well, and he had no lands open anymore. Oh, man. That's bad news for Andy. Now attacking for three. And he's on three measly life. He's actually going to lose this despite all the card advantage and the mana advantage. Let's see. Hopefully, you know, find something. Find something here, Andy. I can ping him to two no matter what. And he's going to tap. He's going to try to find more. Drawing another extra card. Playing a Plains. Can he play another creature? And then hope that I don't have another counter spell. Already played a Force Spike and a Power Sink. I still have some counter spells in my deck, including the counter spell. What is he going to do? Tapping two white for a Pegasus. I can just ping it to death with my Timmy, of course. And looking at my hand, so probably I have another counter spell in there. Yuck. That's even more bad news for Andy. I think I'm probably going to ping the Pegasus and then I'm going to finish it. I'm actually going to put him on two. Okay, and then I'm going to attack, forcing him, playing another island, finding a land finally, attacking here. And the Pegasus is going to die. And he's going to pay three to untap the monolith. And I think I didn't try to kill the Pegasus because of the uh, Taunus's weaponry, because he can use that to make his Pegasus into a 2-2. So if I tried to ping him in response, he could have pumped it up to a 2-2. And drawing an extra card with the Jam Day Tome. I think this is your last turn, Andy. You still need a Miracle. Or at least a disenchant for the Jade Statue or a big creature to block or, uh, you know, something to gain life. Let's see, tapping four, tapping five. Okay, he's going to use his ring. So he's got to discard a card at random now. He's in desperation mode. Kismet is going to go away. Yeah, that's not really going to help him. Going to draw two cards. Still having four lands untapped, so he could do something. Tapping three here, two blue and a white. Casting a dragon engine. 
And uh, that's a 1-3 creature. And for 2, you can actually give it plus 1, plus 0. Oh, and maybe a nice little fact is it's a rare in revised, believe it or not. So you can buy a revised pack. Do you know how expensive those things are? And you can actually find a Dragon Engine as your rare. Wow, that would be a horror scenario. It is a beautiful card, though. Don't get me wrong. I love the card. It's just not really a rare slot card, in my opinion. Anyway, pinging Andy here, going down to one, killing him with the Tim. Ah oh, man, Andy. I'm sorry, man. Showing showing his hand, and I'm showing the counter spell I had still in hand. So, uh, yeah, this was game number two. Now, the good news is we played a third game. So stick around for game number three. Game number three, there we go. So uh, at least in game number two, if we look at the silver lining, uh, is that Andy found Lance and he got a card drawing engine going. So those two things are good. But what he was missing, of course, are like the answers, which is, I mean, White has a lot of answers. So let's hope he can find it in this game. Um, and let's let's see. Let's see what's going to happen. Andy on the plate. Looks like we're both keeping our hands and let's see what he's going to do. And there is a basic island passing turn here. And I'm starting with Ruins of Troikar. Okay, that's funny because in game one and in game two, we saw Andy starting with the Ruins. And now it's my turn, I guess. And he's playing a Mishra's Factory and passing turn. And I'm playing an island and pass. So he can now swing in for two if he wants to take the risk. Or is he going to play out a creature? So he's going to animate the worker swing in for two. And I'm dropping down here to 28. And I'm playing my uh, my altered Timmy. I'm kind of looking at the life total. That's what's distracting me. Looking at my own life total. I seem, for some reason, seem to be taking more damage than I need to. Four damage instead of two damage. But okay. And look at that. Andy playing a balance just to get rid of the protocol sorcerer. That's actually a compliment. You know, thank you, Andy. I see there's a compliment. And I do understand it because when we look at the deck list of Andy, it's full of 1-1s. So for him, a protocol sorcerer is super annoying. So being able to deal with it and, and dealing two damage as well, it's kind of a good deal for him. And now I'm playing Azur Drake 2-4 from Legends. It's a flyer. So that's actually a pretty good blocker for me. Kind of takes away the, uh, the pressure And let's see what Andy can do here. Finding another land, Urza's Mine. So he's got the Mine, oh, sorry, Urza's Power Plant. So he's got the Power Plant and the Mine. Ooh, playing Gaseous Form. This is an interesting card. Um, I think this card is particularly good in multiplayer and not so much in a one-on-one -on -one scenario. So Gaseous Form is an enchant creature from Legends originally. And um, what it does, it says, target creature no longer deals nor receives damage. So he's playing the Gaseous Form on my Azure Drake and then attacking with the assembly worker. I can still block with it though. It's like a wall right now, a wall that cannot do any damage or take any damage. It's kind of not too bad because it also has flying. So I'm not the biggest fan of this card. I can see like in a multiplayer scenario, it can be a really cool card, a really funny card because you can say, hey man, I can guess he's for him and it can be a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, but I think in this scenario, it's not great. Okay, it looks like I'm tapping five here. What am I gonna cast? And okay, there's a Vesuvan double ganger. So this is one of the reasons why I don't like Gassy's form. So the original Azure Drake is kind of useless because of the Gassy's form, but I can still clone it. I can still copy it. I can still sacrifice it. I can still block with it. So there's so many things you can do. In this case, I'm cloning it with my Vesuvan double ganger. So I have two, two, four flying creatures on the board right now. Let's see what Andy can do. At least he's got lands. Can he also find a creature? Finding another land, playing a planes. Okay, taking it back, playing an island instead. Okay, man, no worries. Tapping six. What is he going to cast? Oh, there we see. We see Gjörnarsson hitting the board. So a 5-4 human warrior, right? Kind of the captain of the deck of Andy. And it's got Rampage once. So it's actually pretty big. But again, I can just block it with my Gaseous Form Flyer. And uh, no harm, no foul. And I wonder if I'm going to change my uh, Vesuvan Doubleganger into uh, into the uh, to Gjörnersen. I 
It looks like I'm not. I'm just attacking for two through the air, putting Andy on 28. And there I'm playing Hand of Justice. Oh, man. I remember Hand of Justice when Fallen Empires came out. And I really wanted to open it. I don't think I ever pulled it out of a pack, actually. It's a 2-6 creature. And uh, what it does, you can... Uh, Tap it together with three white creatures and you can destroy target creature. And that just seemed ridiculously powerful at the time. And there's a Jalem Tome being played by Andy. So at least that can help him a little bit. Looks like he's going to animate his factory. Not sure why he's doing this. Attacking with both. And uh, the Gjernerson is a 5-4 by the way. So I can just use... I'm not sure why I'm taking damage here. What I can do is just use my Azur Drake on Gjernerson. Use the Hand of Justice on the Mishra's factory. A little bit unclear what's happening here. Actually, I think I remember what happened. Andy made the mistake of attacking with the factory and I made the mistake of not blocking with my Azur Drake. And I said to Andy, shall we just all take it back? And, and he said, no man, if I make a mistake, I've made the play and I'll, I'll make the mistake. So then I also said, okay, then I'm gonna take the damage from, from Gjernerson as well. Because that's kind of fair. And actually, Andy, I appreciate that. Because I think um, it, it would have been fine if you wanted to take it back, by the way. But I think it's 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 better to just make the mistake and deal with it. Because that makes you a better player in the end. You know, you become a better player by can, kind of saying, okay, this is, this is the result of my mistake. If you know what I mean. I'm not sure if I'm making sense right now. But that's, uh, that's kind of how I look at it. Um... That being said, I'm always super relaxed if opponents want to take something back. Ooh, this is interesting here. We see Andy playing a Witch Hunter. And this Witch Hunter actually could be quite good. I'm not countering it, not doing anything against it. Witch Hunter, two white and one. And it and you can tap and it can turn back target creature uh, to its owner's hand. So that could be quite interesting. He could choose to, for example, send back the Azur Drake. That is interesting. Gassy's form still on the Azur Drake here. Tapping, playing Thower Stone. And of course, I can also use my Fajuran Enchantress to turn it into a Witch Hunter. Oh, of course. So now I know I'm going to change my Vesuvan Double Ganger into Witch Hunter. Vesuvan Double Ganger doesn't have summoning sickness, so I can use it straight away and I'm Sending back the Witch Hunter. Oh, man. That is unfortunate, Andy. Like, every time I seem to have an answer. Let's see what Andy can do. And you can really see kind of the control element of my deck. Finding ways to kind of take over the game. There we see Andy drawing a card and discarding a card to the Jalem Tome. Tapping four, and he had the occasion. Is it occasion skirmisher? Is that the name? And he's playing an Azur Drake. It's a pretty cool card, by the way, from Fallen Empires. Uh, that one that he just discarded. Um, it's a one one. It's got banding, and if you everything that bands with it gains first strike. So the band always has first strike. It's a unique ability in old school. Very expensive to cast, I believe. I mean, is it four or five? Anyway, but it's a, it's a very cool card because of that unique banding first strike ability. It's a, it's one of those oddballs. I really like it, but I'm, I'm a fan of Fallen Empire, so I'm not very objective. And it looks like I'm just passing turn here. Remember, my Vesuvan Double Ganger is a Witch Hunter. So I can just, I can start pinging, I mean, sending back creatures... This is not looking good for Andy here. Using his tome again. And discarding the gem day tome. Interesting. I wonder what he has in hand. Playing a land. Tapping four. Okay, what's going to happen? Maybe is he going to play out the witch hunter again? Okay, playing the Knights of Thorn, a 2-2 Bander uh, with protection from red. And I'm going to send back his, uh, his Gjörnersen, or Gjörnersen. 
And tapping more. There's Rubinha, Soul Singer. Oh, man. This is looking really bad again here for Andy. Because again, I'm kind of taking over this game. Does Andy play with Wrath of God? I kind of forgot because a Wrath of God could kind of help him. I mean, he just needs a board wipe again. He needs to he needs to get rid of the Fasuf and Double Ganger. He needs to get rid of the Rubinia Soul Singer. And look at that. Throwing away a Sylvan Library. Cannot find a green source. That's too bad, though, because that Sylvan would be quite nice for him. Sending back another creature so that Witch Hunter is really helpful for me. And taking over his Knights of Thorn. With a counter kind of indicating that I've taken over one of his creatures. Attacking him for 5. He's going to go to 21. And passing turn here. I mean, his hand is full. The problem is, I mean, I've got that super annoying Witch Hunter. That's the problem. If he can just at least get rid of the Vesuvan, but then again, if he plays out a big threat, I'll just untap my Rubinia Soul Singer and steal that and give him back his Knight. I mean, Rubinia Soul Singer, a really strong card. I, I believe it's also being played in modern EDH. Let's see what he can do. Tapping six. Oh, I like this. Playing out an Ecation Town. Oh, man, it's such a lovely card. Actually, that card goes together really well with Hand of Justice. It's really like one of those Fallen Empires uh, combos. One of the first combos that I ever played because it was so obvious that even I understood it as an 11-year-old boy. You know, I was like, oh, wait a minute. These cards work together. Yeah. Oh, that was so nice. Anyway, I can, of course, use that annoying Witch Hunter ability over and over and over again to send the tokens back to his hand. And when you unsummon a token, of course, it disappears. So I can basically use it as a token destroyer. And now I'm attacking with the 2-2 uh, Knight in a band with the Clay Statue. So that's actually a 5-3. And I'm attacking with the Hand of Justice. And remember, with a band, I can decide where the damage goes. So I can basically put all the damage on my clay statue and regenerate the clay statue for two. That's probably what's going to happen here. And it looks like he's just taking the damage. Okay, he's blocking one. He's going to 19, so taking two damage. And I'm playing a rocket launcher. That's the artist-proof rocket launcher that I talked about in the deck tech section. And Andy really being in the tank here. I, I, just, I just don't see a way out for him here. What can he do, really? Playing an enchantment alteration. Okay, that's kind of funny. He can put it on one of his tokens, but then in response, I can bounce it? I'm probably... I don't even have to bounce it in response. I can just wait. I can do whatever. And then his guessing his form is out of the game, right? I think that Witch Hunter is really a problem here. Look at that. He's discarding another card. Of course, because of the Jalem Tome. That's why he's doing that. And I think what we were discussing is I was saying, um, or I think he was saying that, that, oh, wait a minute, I should have used the enchantment alteration in like a combat scenario. And that's true. That's something that you can do. He, let's say he still had the... Um, the uh, Gurnerson on the board, he would attack with Gurnerson. I would block with my Azur Drake with the um, Gaius Forum on it. Then before damage was dealt, uh, he could play the Enchantment Alteration. Okay, and there we see me playing a Power Sink, Power Sinking his Azur Drake. And now he's got to tap that one white. Things are just keep getting worse for uh, for my opponent here. And uh, using the uh, Vesuvan Doubleganger Witch Hunter again, probably to bounce back, exactly bounce back that token. That means he's going to lose the token and the Gaius Form, or sorry, Gaseous Form. And now I'm going to swing in with everything I have here. So that's two, five, seven, 
nine points of damage he's going to go to nine life or maybe he's going to block with his one token he might as well because i'm going to destroy it anyway it's probably going to block the uh clay statue regenerating the clay statue so he's going to go to 12 life taking seven instead of nine there's not much he can do he can, i mean he can play out the witch hunter again i'm just going to bounce it finding a strip mine which is not very useful at the moment. Going to use the strip on the tundra. Going to use the jalum. You could even think that maybe he could have kept the strip mine in hand to discard it to the jalum tome. There is a disenchant. Okay. Ah, spell blast. That is unfortunate. I guess, I mean, my control deck looks very annoying. I mean, that's what a control deck does, I guess. It has answers. And what, once a control deck is ahead, it's, it's difficult to play against. And there is a Sage of Latinam. Oh, man, what a cool creature. And it is a 1-2, actually, not a 1-1. One, one. And a Sage of Latinam. I mean, it's not going to save Andy, but it's definitely a cool creature. One of my favorite creatures. And pretty useful in some decks. And playing an Argivian Archaeologist. I don't think I have any artifacts in uh, in my graveyard because I countered that disenchant. And now I'm attacking, and uh, Andy going to three. If you use the rocket launcher, it looks like to kill the Sage of Latinam. Because why not? Tapping a blue. Playing Drafnas Restoration. That's actually a pretty nice card from Antiquities. You can pick as many artifacts that you want from your graveyard and then put them on top of your library in any order. Uh, which is nice with the Jalem Tome, but yeah, no, that's it. It's not gonna, it's not gonna help him. Oh, wow, man. I mean, Andy, I feel like your deck wasn't showing, wasn't performing what it was supposed to do. I think, and we were talking about this after the match. I think your idea of the deck was that it would be kind of aggressive and would be like put a lot of pressure on the opponent from the get go. And that didn't happen any game. I mean, you just had to face off against, you know, control cards or you couldn't find your, your, your creatures or for whatever reason, your deck doesn't work yet, but that is the fun when you brew your own decks. That is the fun when you try out things and you try goofy stuff. And that is also why I love kitchen table magic because you try out a deck and there's a chance that you fail, but there's also a small chance that you see some cool synergy and everything works. In this case, the deck is not working. So what do you do? You go back to the drawing board and you try again and we'll play again in the future man i liked it i appreciated it um if you like this format by the way like i said in the introduction check the description below for the rule set um i think what we played in this game was called brothers highlander it's my favorite version of highlander my, personally but feel free to you know find your own way um you know in in in, in all the rule sets there are so many uh but for now thank you very much for watching let me know what you think of the decks and what you think of the format Highlander. I would love to hear from you. And by leaving a comment, you're actually also helping the channel. You're helping Timmy Talks grow. Talking about that, what you can also do is you can leave a like and you can, of course, become a subscriber. If you're not a subscriber yet, all that really helps and it shows you to YouTube that you appreciate the content that I make. Another thing that you can do is you can sponsor the channel financially and you can do that by becoming a patron 
via Patreon. So there's probably a card popping up right now. And if you click on an info card, that will take you straight to the Patreon page of Timmy Talks. And there you can support the channel starting with $1 a month. So if you can spare something and you wanna help me out, help me grow the channel, you can do that via Patreon. And if you do, there are a few perks. One of them is your name will become listed in the end scroll how cool is that talking about that let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the fantastic the amazing patrons and channel members of timmy talks what shall we do with the drunken sailor what shall we do with the drunken sailor what shall we do with the drunken sailor Ik het als ik het als zomba kan zien.